Roll for the Galaxy is the dice version of the critically acclaimed Race for the Galaxy card game. In Roll for the Galaxy, you are the head of a galactic faction with dreams of becoming the greatest space empire in the galaxy. From the humble beginnings of a couple of planets and some unique technology, you'll acquire and employ workers to either further expand your holdings or ship goods to faraway worlds for influence and profit. A game of Roll for the Galaxy can be played with two to five players. Each player will have a dice cup, player screen, phase strip, player mat, and credits marker. The dice cup and phase strip are placed behind the player screen while the player mat and credits marker are placed in front. On the player mat there are four sections. The citizenry space, development space, world space, and credits track. The major difference between Roll for the Galaxy and its predecessor, Race for the Galaxy, are the dice. Seven different colors and six unique symbols compose the 111 six-sided dice. These dice are known as workers, but are then given different names according to their color and roll. We'll go over more on what the dice do later in the video. For now, let's look at the tiles. The nine faction tiles and nine homeworld tiles are starting tiles each player will receive when setting up the game. The five phase tiles are communal and will be used to indicate which phases were selected. The 55 double-sided tiles have a development side and a world side. These tiles are what players will acquire to grow their empire. The black bag is for storing and distributing the 55 double-sided tiles. Lastly, there are 33 victory point chips that are divided into small value, medium value, and large value. To start, make sure all double-sided development and world tiles are in the black bag, then place all five phase tiles in the center of the table on their X side. Give each player a player mat along with a dice cup and credits marker in the color of their choice. Each player places their credits marker on the one space on the credits track. Then hand a player screen and phase strip to each player and place 12 victory point chips per player next to the phase tiles in the center of the table. Once everybody has their starting setup, deal each player a random faction tile and a random homeworld tile. Each player will lay their faction tile and homeworld tile next to their player mat in front of their player screen. This tableau of tiles will represent each player's empire and will contain all of a player's completed developments and settlements later in the game. Return any extra faction tiles and homeworld tiles to the game box. Next are the starting worker dice. Each player will get three white home dice to put in their dice cup and two more white home dice to place on their citizenry space. Then they get additional dice specified on their starting faction and homeworld tiles. Finally, each player draws two tiles from the black bag containing double-sided development and world tiles. Place one of these tiles development side up on the development space and the other world side up on the world space. When looking at the tiles, there are a few important things to know. First, each tile is identified by their icon and color on the top left. Development tiles have a diamond icon and a single color. World tiles have a circle icon and seven different colors. On every icon is a number. The number is the cost to place the tile on a player's tableau. Once the cost has been met, the tile is placed. World tiles have an immediate effect when placed that occurs only once. Development tiles have a continuous effect that occurs every time it triggers. Let's go ahead and look at how each round is played. A game of Roll for the Galaxy is played in rounds that continuously repeat until one of the two end game requirements is met. Each round is divided into five steps. First is the Roll step, followed by the Assign step, then Reveal Step, Phases Step, and finally, the Manage Empire Step. In the Roll Step, each player simultaneously rolls the dice in their dice cup secretly behind their player screen. Then they grab each die and organize them according to the symbol it rolled on. As you can see, there are five spaces on the phase strip, each with a unique symbol. These same symbols are on each side of the dice, with a sixth side having a star symbol. Each of those matching symbols represent a phase. The I symbol is the first phase, explore. The diamond symbol is the second phase, develop. The circle symbol is the third phase, 
settle. The good symbol is the fourth phase, produce. The rocket ship symbol is the fifth phase, ship. And the star symbol means wild or any phase. Players will organize their rolled dice by placing them below each matching symbol on their phase strip. After all dice have been placed comes the assign step. During the assign step, all players simultaneously perform their phase selection and reassign powers. For the phase selection, each player takes one die and places it on any phase space on their phase strip regardless of matching symbols. Then each player may perform reassign powers from any development tiles on their tableau or by using the built-in reassign power called dictate. To dictate, a player selects one of their dice that's below the phase strip and places it on the dictate area located on the top right side of their phase strip. Then that player selects another die that's below the phase strip and places it on a different column regardless of matching symbols. The reason a player would reassign their dice to a different column is to increase the amount of workers for one of the five phases. We'll get into phases in a minute. For now, let's look at the next step. After all players are done assigning their dice, comes the reveal step. This is when everyone reveals their dice setup and announces which phase they selected. For each selected phase, flip up the matching phase tile from its X side to its black side. For example, Explore, Develop, and Produce were chosen from all players during the assign phase, and so their respective phase tiles get flipped from their X side to the black side. On your phase strip, you have assigned a worker die on the explore space, but you also have a worker die below the produce space, ship space, and a worker die in your dictate area. Because the ship space is still on its X side and a worker is on your dictate area, the worker below the ship phase space and worker on your dictate area return to your dice cup. After all dice setups have been revealed and workers return to their owner's dice cup, comes the phases step. There are five phases and they are ordered numerically. When the phases step begins, all players will play phases that still have worker dice located either on or below their phase strip. These remaining worker dice will have a new name according to the phase they were placed in. For the first phase, Explore, a player will have two choices for each of their Explorer dice. These Explorers can either scout for a new tile or stock to gain credits. Each Explorer die must be used one at a time and then placed in its owner's citizenry space. When a player uses an Explorer die to scout, they draw one tile randomly from the black bag, choose either its development side or world side, and place it on the bottom of its respective stack on the player mat. A player may choose to draw more than one tile when scouting by abandoning the tiles on their development space or settlement space. To abandon a tile, first take any number of tiles from the development or settlement space and place them under the explore phase tile. Then draw and place tiles from the black bag one at a time for each abandoned tile plus one for the explorer die that was chosen to scout. Abandoned tiles that were placed under the explore phase tile are put back in the bag after everyone is done exploring. To use an Explorer die to stock, a player simply moves their credits marker up two spaces on the credits track. Both the Develop and Settle phases are virtually identical. In the Develop phase, a player may take their developer dice and place them on top of the development stack one at a time. Once there are enough dice equal to the cost of the tile, they immediately move those dice to the citizenry and add that tile to their tableau. That player may then continue putting more developer dice onto the next tile to pay for its cost. If those developer dice do not cover the cost for the tile, they remain on that tile unless recalled. If there are still developer dice below the phase strip and the development stack is empty, those remaining developer dice will return to the owner's dice cup. The settlement phase works the same way, except settler dice are instead placed on top of the world stack. Again, if the cost on the topmost world is equal to or less than the settler dice that are placed on it, those dice immediately move to the citizenry and that world tile is now added to the tableau. And just like the develop phase, settler dice placed on a world tile that do not cover the cost remain on that world tile unless recalled. Any world tiles that are added to the tableau will have an immediate effect. So make sure to read and perform those effects as it only occurs when that tile is placed. 
The produce and ship phases are also closely related to each other. In the produce phase, producer dice are placed on any of the colored world tiles in a player's tableau. These dice and worlds do not have to match colors, but a bonus may get applied later if they do. Each world tile can have only one producer die on it, and that producer die will now be called a goods die. Leftover producer dice are returned to its owner's cup. For the ship phase, each shipper die goes to one of the world tiles with a goods die, then the player with the shipper die chooses to either trade or consume. When trade is selected, the player with the shipper die and the goods die gain credits according to the color of the goods world. When consume is selected, each goods die is worth one victory point and an additional victory point if the color of the good or the color of the ship each match the world it was shipped from with a max of three points per consume. Any unused shipper dice are returned to the owner's dice cup. The last step is the Manage Empire step. In this step, each player will first move any number of dice from their citizenry space to their dice cup by paying one credit per die. If a player's credits are at zero after this, then they move their credits marker back up to the one space. Players can also recall any number of their remaining developer dice, settler dice, or goods dice and put them back in their dice cup for free. If a player does not have any dice in their cup, they must recall one of their dice. Finally, all face tiles get flipped back to their X side and players check the two endgame requirements. If there are no victory points left or if a player has 12 or more tiles on their tableau, the game is over. Otherwise, it's time to start the next round. Rounds are continuously played until one of the two endgame requirements have been met. Then, once the game ends, each player counts up their victory points. To do this, first add victory point chips, then add the total cost from all development and world tiles, and any bonus victory points for completing objectives on six cost development tiles. If there is a tie, then check who has the most dice in their cup, followed by who has the most credits. The person with the highest score wins. That's it for our tutorial. Visit CoolStuffInc.com today to purchase Roll for the Galaxy or others like it. Thanks for watching.